We all chose this area because of the, the strong schools, jobs, safe communities, good health care. And I want to make sure that all those quality of life pillars uh, of our community are strong going forward. You're listening to Peachtree Corners Life, a weekly online radio show sharing ideas, opinions, and news about the city of Peachtree Corners. Now, your host, Rico Figliolini. Hi, everyone. This is Rico Figliolini, host of Peachtree Corners Life, and I appreciate you coming to the show. We're doing this socially safe in the city of Peachtree Corners. And before we get to our guest who's on screen, Matt Reeves. Hey, Matt. How are you? Hello. I'll introduce him, and he's going to introduce himself. But first, before we get into that, I want to just talk about our lead sponsor, Hargrave Fiber. They're a southeastern company that does fiber optics for the business community and for consumers, but the fiber side of it is delivering the type of speed and and services necessary for small businesses and large businesses, enterprise businesses, to do their work in this teleworking environment during the COVID-19. And hopefully, and providing services unlike the cable companies. Really, they're right there in the community and they're providing a lot of things in the community. They are very involved in every community they're in, whether it's Savannah, Peachtree Corners, Macon, Georgia, all over the Southeast, Tallahassee, Florida. They are there. So visit HargraveFiber.com or Hargrave.com forward slash business to find how you can work your smart office and work with them. So now that we've done that, I want to tell you that we're going to be discussing a lot of issues over the next 30 to 40 minutes with Republican State Senate candidate Matt Reeves. We're going to be discussing issues of the day, COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, state ethics, term limits, all sorts of things. We're going to be going back and forth on this. But before we get into all that, I'd like to have Matt introduce himself and uh, tell us why we should be uh, listening to him as a candidate for state Senate. Thanks, Rico, and uh, great to connect with folks in the audience from uh, Peachtree Corners. I definitely want to be a great advocate for Peachtree Corners in Gwinnett County and North Fulton in the State Senate. My name is Matt Reeves. I'm a resident of Duluth for the last uh, 17 years, so I live right next door in Gwinnett County. I have practiced law, business, and real estate uh, litigation at Anderson Tate and Carl Law Firm for that 17 years. I went to University of Georgia Law School before that, and then Mercer um, undergrad to uh, college before that. Uh, my wife, Suzette, and I and our three kids who are 11th grade, 8th grade, and 5th grade I live in Duluth. We're active in the community, and I just want to serve uh, our community and keep the quality of life strong in Peachtree Corners, Berkeley Lake, Duluth, Swanee, uh, part of Lawrenceville, Johns Creek, part of Alpharetta, uh, part of Norcross for the next generation. We all chose this area because of the, the strong schools, jobs, safe communities, good health care, and I want to make sure that all those quality of life pillars uh, of our community are strong going forward. The, the state Senate has 35 Republicans and 21 Democrats. I'm reaching out to independents, to centrist Democrats, as well as Republicans, uh, to be a good advocate for our community, because I believe I can get more done for Peachtree Corners and the state Senate on the Republican side of the aisle. I know there are a couple of issues, the Rico, that you've selected uh, but just, you know, uh, one thing to know is uh, I spent some time at the Capitol years ago as a lawyer for the House Judiciary Committee in 2008. I worked with Wendell Willard, who was the uh, one of the leaders on the New Cities Movement, which Peachtree Corners benefited greatly from. Uh, Chairman Tom Rice was laying the groundwork for the work in the legislature for uh, Peachtree Corners, as was Senator David Schaefer in 2008 when I was down there. Dunwoody was the city that was spearheaded during the session that I was down there, but I got to see the early stages of Peachtree Corners. And over the last eight years, Peachtree Corners definitely has been a leader in our region as a new city. And I look forward to being an effective advocate and a bipartisan problem solver on behalf of Peachtree Corners in the state Senate and hope to earn people's support in the community for this competitive state Senate seat. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you came on with me. I remember doing this from home, I think. You That's know, right. About two, two and a half years ago during the uh, campaign in 2018, when you ran the first time. And that was, you know, during the, was it the blue wave, we shall say, Democrats coming into House seats and, and positions. 2020 is a little different. You know, I don't know if that, if that still will go on. So this is a proven, this is going to be a test, right? To some That's degree, right. To see what the voters want. And so this is a good way to be able to talk to you and 
and see if if your point of view is, is what you know the voters here want in 2020. And I, I, uh, politics and partisan politics changes like the weather. I think what folks in Peachtree Corners and Gwinnett County, what they ask is who can do the best job for them in this particular office. And uh, that's what I'm focusing on in the state Senate race. Who can do the best job for Peachtree Corners in the state Senate seat for the benefit of our schools, uh, safety of our communities, transportation solutions, health care the things that are important to us and make our community strong, who can be a better advocate in the state Senate. You know, David Schaefer was the president pro tem of the Senate. He was number one out of 50 senators. The the Democrat who won in 2018 uh, got put on the agriculture committee, which is not exactly the kind of position Peachtree Corners wants to have uh, down there in the Senate and then higher office. And it's an open seat again. So we get to make a choice about for the next two years, who can serve Peachtree Corners and tackle the issues that face uh, homeowners and and voters and families and small businesses in Peachtree Corners and be a good advocate in this uh, turbulent time where you've got, you know, COVID-19, you've got civil unrest. Who can lead the way and make sure Georgia remains number one in jobs, has an increasing number of jobs with health insurance coverage? You know, there's no government program any better for an adult than a than a job is. There's no government program any better than a, uh, for a child and a family is. I think state government ought to do a few things and do them well and keep a climate where we have, where we continue to be attractive for employers and jobs so that families can meet their uh, their needs and have their kids getting educated and going to college and have a bright future in the job market. That's my goal in the state Senate. Yeah, it's interesting because it's, it is certainly a different look at it, more conservative look at it. I do believe in personal responsibilities, but I also believe government is there to do certain things. Certainly, I believe the federal government should have spearheaded more than they have during the COVID-19 time. But, you know, different points of views, and this is what this is about. An election in 2020, different than any other election in our history, for a simple matter that a lot of people may not be going to the polls in person, right? They're going to be mail ballots, I mean, Georgia put out over 6 million absentee ballot request forms and over a million responded more than any, you know, I think it was 10 or 12 times more than any other year, in fact. So that may still happen November 3rd. We may still end up doing that, seeing that happen because of COVID-19. So staying on the issue of COVID-19, do you think Governor Kemp has done the right job in, in, in the approach that he has done? Would you do anything different? Do you th- see the state Senate providing any other leadership in this from your point of view? Going forward, what what I would do as a state senator is to make sure that the 95 percent or more of the population that has not directly encountered COVID, that they have their health care needs attended to without disruption this has been uh, an, an unexpected, invisible enemy that has attacked us. We've handled things on an urgent basis, but it troubles me to see that 100% of the resources in healthcare and in you know the gov- part of the government that deals with healthcare is devoted to COVID. When you've got folks with diabetes, heart conditions, cancer, many other elective surgery, I talked to somebody this week who has had a thyroid procedure delayed since March due to COVID issues. And I want to make sure that we definitely attack COVID to preserve lives and livelihoods, but also make sure that healthcare needs for the other 95% of the population are attended to. And, you know, part of that is making sure that we're smart about how we open back up. You know, it sounds like right now, the thing that has gotten us up at the top in Gwinnett County, and then you look in Texas and Houston, We have a very strong young population and people like my mother-in-law and people my age and older uh, have heeded the warnings. I've got my I've got my UGA uh, mask and, you know, if I'm out indoors uh, in public, I've got that mask on. My office has adopted a protocol from a local engineering firm that is working well here. We get the memo uh, in in the uh, middle age and up here in Gwinnett County, but young people. Uh, have, I think, too rapidly disregarded social distancing and other uh, health precautions for uh, COVID. And also, 
translating into uh, multi-generational families who, uh, with English as a second language, I think that we need to do a better job of reaching that because both in Atlanta as well as Houston and some other major metro areas, those are two areas. I heard Dr. Arona, the Gwinnett County and Rockdale and Newton uh, health director this, this week, mentioned that, that Lilburn and Norcross, the testing centers there, uh, you see a lot of multi-generational families with English as a second language getting hit hard by COVID. So we need to literally communicate in a uh, credible uh, and strong way that's easy to understand for our diverse population. I think that will uh, turn the curve. You know, back in March and April, the focus nationally and in Georgia was bending the curve. And we did that for a large uh, portion of the population, but we are now a top 15 metro area in the country. And Gwinnett County is leading Atlanta in cases because I think in large part the young people as well as a a larger population. We're a larger population too, right? The biggest county in the state. I mean, when I drive by CVS, that's right near here on certain days, there will be 15 cars wrapped around that building. So people doing their testing. Yeah, we're still some of the some of the testing has to be referred testing, it seems. So you have to be symptomatic to a degree right. where your doctor has to send you there. In some places, you don't have to be uh, symptomatic. You like Georgia Tech, Walgreens, I think will accept and do testing for you if you're asymptomatic. You know, there's that. But for a long time, too, I know some of the cities, it's difficult to mandate a mask, I guess, right, to some degree. Because if you mandate it, you have to penalize it if you're not wearing it, right? Right. Because otherwise, does that work or not? Now, I've had the discussion with my son about this, and, and he brings up a good point. He says, well, yes, sure. Do you cite people $50 or $75 for that ticket? Or does the governor mandate it? And even if no one gets cited for it, right, there's a different feel about being saying that the mask is mandated and uh, people will understand then maybe that they really do need to wear that mask you know so sometimes it's perception right it's the it's it's the the lens that you look through it but we need to do something because it's just not i mean i go out with the mask all the time i guess i'm part of that demo well and and also covid is an international um crisis and so not only do we have 50 states that we can learn health care and medical lessons from but we have literally hundreds of countries who have approached this situation differently. And there are some success stories in Asia and other countries, uh, South Korea, Japan. Also, the U.S. is one of the few countries that takes the summer off of school. And so hitting in January and and ramping up and, and really reaching us in mass in March, now and having six and seven months of experience internationally with COVID, uh, you know, 95% of the parents locally want to get their kids back in school in person. But I think we can look around the world and see best practices on getting kids uh, and teachers safely returned to school. Um, so what, and- would, what, would, what would you do to do that? I know there's a, you know, I have a 16 year old that wants, he wants to go back to school. He's, he wants to be able to do an AP calculus in person versus online, right? So there are kids that want to go back for social reasons also. Right. Um, how can we keep them safe then? Is there anything, how would your leadership change on that? You know, well, how do we put them back? To number one, I trust the locals. I think the local school boards uh, and local school superintendents can make decisions for the best interest of their teachers and students better than somebody in downtown Atlanta or Washington, D.C. can. And I think that North Fulton, which their their biggest schools in North Fulton are, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 students. We're in Gwinnett. We have the jumbo size high schools with closer to 3,000 or more students a lot of times. So every school system is different. I think that we ought to listen closely to parents and, and in large numbers, the students also are saying they want to get back in person. But there are some outliers where people want to do digital learning for health reasons or other reasons or personal precaution reasons. So I think that we ought to give people choices whenever possible in this uncharted waters of of COVID. But I think we need to do everything we can to uh, get kids back to school safely, as well as teachers. And we need to look around the country. We need to look around the world about how other countries and other states uh, have safely had had students return to school. 
the toll on these young people's education is high. And we need to make sure that the ground that was lost in March and April and May, that we make up for that and the kids uh, don't get behind because, uh, you know, there's a digital divide in Gwinnett. It's discernible. A lot of kids didn't have the technology readily available when they got sent home. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids never logged in. Some of that is support at home priority on education. Other other situation is it's resources, but getting those kids' attention back on their education is critical so, to so our let state. Me, so let me ask you this, and then we'll, and then I want to move on to another subject. But just to close this out a little bit, the budget, the state budget, cut education. Now, it cut a lot of things across the board, but it did cut education as part of it. When a county is remaining with its budget, I believe, and they're not going to furlough people, they are mandating masks. So obviously they need to buy PPE stuff to be able to do that because some people may not have masks and some kids and families and stuff, they're going to need those masks, right? So they're mandating that for the fall if they actually open up. And they're giving two choices, either you do online learning or you do in-person learning. So it depends on how people want to choose that and where they want to go and if they can afford to do that. Like you said, people are going back to work to some degree unless things get rolled back. So where do they send their kids while they're working, right? Because school works almost as a daycare in a way. Yes. Kids in school uh, during the time that adults are working and stuff. So, you know, the state cut that budget. I mean, would you have voted for that cut? Would you? Have, what would you have done? How would you have affected that? How would you want to help school systems throughout the state? Because Gwinnett County is one that probably can afford to do some of the stuff. But there are other counties and other parts that might not be able to do that same thing. So how would you, how would a Matt Reeves position be on something like that? Well, Rico, when times are, are tough and the revenue decreases in state government, it becomes all the more critical to have a strong advocate for your area down in the uh, state Senate. Because uh, I was there in 2008 when uh, revenue started to decline as the uh, Great Recession hit. And I saw what happens when you have limited resources. The ones uh, who are effective advocates for their districts are the areas of Georgia that are looked after well. At that point, that was uh, towards the tail end of Governor Purdue's uh, time in office. So folks in middle Georgia were well looked after. That's where Larry O'Neill was chairman of Ways and Means. He was literally Governor Purdue's lawyer back back home on personal matters. And so in a competitive political landscape where we have very strongly held feelings on national issues, I would ask folks in Peachtree Corners and Gwinnett County and North Fulton for this critical state Senate seat to ask who can help our area the best in the state Senate where it's 35 Republicans, 21 Democrats. I want education money at a time when uh, times are tough financially to go to Gwinnett County schools. If we have somebody who's on the short end of a 35 to 21 vote, you're going to have funds go to Cobb County, Forsyth County, Cherokee County, where folks are in the majority. Um, I want to be a strong and effective advocate for North Fulton schools and Gwinnett schools and the state Senate. When, you know, there's a saying, if, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. And, you know, uh, we're, we're talking a lot about health care. And, and so I want to be in the position of getting resources and decisions and public policy made in favor of our Gwinnett and North Fulton schools, rather than having others uh, make those decisions for the benefit of their own districts elsewhere. How do you so so let's uh, and I appreciate that. And I think the citizens of Peach Corners appreciates that point of view. They want their representatives to, you know, think big, broad, but they're also local, right? That's, right. We all, that's why we have a representative there to be able to talk local and be able to help uh, a city like ours or, or the area that you represent, Sewanee and the other areas as well. But let's change uh, directions a little bit. Let's talk about the other news because 2020 is just unusual for all sorts of reasons. So COVID-19 is one, but also the social unrest, Black Lives Matter, the whole social justice, police violence against black community, people of black and brown color. Um, It's just been a tough situation. It's been also a tough situation to speak honestly a little bit about these things, because sometimes people can get shut down on both sides of it, rather than being allowed to be transparent and talk about issues. 
because it's a sensitive issue. And so I know people are out there saying, well, some people shouldn't even talk about this issue because maybe they don't have a, an experience in it. But I think we all need to talk about it right? culturally and for a variety of reasons. How do you feel about this issue? Where would, you know, you, what do you think as the state Senate should do? What do you think your position on, on this should be? And, and where are you on this view? Well, I learned a lot and I listened and the peaceful protest in Duluth. My wife, Suzette, and I went to that along with friends from a group of city ministry team friends that we had through Perimeter Church. There's a, a group of pastors in Duluth called the Unite Churches, which is a, a culturally diverse group of pastors, African-American, Asian, Latino, Perimeter Church, which is you know a, a growingly diverse church, but uh, a lot of Caucasian people there. But we went to that peaceful protest, listened, learned a lot, and cared uh, and expressed attention and concern with this issue. Uh, obviously, what happened with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and others, uh, it's wrong, it's tragic. It showed us that sometimes you can have uh, fatal and, and murder actions by folks who wear a uniform. You know, the Bill of Rights, going back to our founding documents, half of the Bill of Rights dealt with the criminal justice and keeping government in check and serving the people. 99% of folks with a badge uh, in law enforcement are good people who are serving the public. But there's always a, a danger of disastrous consequences of folks in, in with government power abusing that, particularly with minorities and other people who, uh, you know, are helpless and in custody and, you know, can't breathe. And so that hurts my heart. It's something I want to do something about. But I would like to acknowledge uh, the fact that Georgia has been a leader in what people are asking for now, criminal justice reform. Over the last decade, Georgia has uh, been a leader in the nation in that area. We have put a priority on getting people rehabilitated and back into the workforce and not having a scarlet letter for life if, if you make a mistake. Uh, we've, we've said in Georgia, we want to get people off of drugs and out of a life of crime. We want to get people educated and employed. And I think that's a good thing. And, you know, we don't want to warehouse people in jail and throw away the key. We want to get people rehabilitated. Now, folks who've made a decision to live a life of armed robbery and home invasion and rape and murder and, and gun crimes, you know, they need to be locked up. But uh, there are many first-time offenders, uh, sadly, people who've come back and are young veterans who, you know, are suffering from a disruption in their life. We have a veterans court in Gwinnett as a result of that criminal justice reform that are helping young veterans who've come back and kind of lost their way in addiction and, and other pain and made some bad choices. So DUI court, veterans court, mental health court, intervention in a way that turns around people. That's been something that's been good. You know, Georgia started as a debtor's colony. We've always believed in a second chance. Yes. And I think we need to realize our, well, Georgia our has a lot. Of, also, Georgia has a lot of history and other things as well. Well, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King is from here. The black yes. community and the yeah. Christian community in Georgia produced yeah. Martin Luther King. And so Georgia has some very special things. We're now a leader in population and economy. We need to step up to the plate and uh, lead the way in the country on criminal justice reform and other so things. That we'll you, so, so the Matt, I, listen, I come from New York. So moving down here in 95, <clears> south <throat> of the Mason-Dixon line, if you will. It's an old term, right? Most people don't know that, I guess. Um, but, you know, it, it is different. If I go out into, and good people, I'm not saying bad people, good people, good ways, but there's certainly different points of views depending where you go in the state. So not everything is as good as, as it needs to be, right? That's all right. I'm honest about that. And, and Rico, let me say on that, my metric, whether you're in America's Georgia or Albany, Georgia, or, mm -hmm. or Macon, or here in Gwinnett County, I think every... Um, Black parent and grandparent, they want their young people to have a diploma, to have career opportunities, to have money in the bank, to be treated fairly. Those are things I think that we can agree on across racial lines and make sure that the American dream is alive and well in Georgia. But my metric is those. Let's get our young people educated, have bright employment opportunity, and make sure that they have access to the American dream and there are not barriers totally, there. I look around Atlanta, 
we need to have more community banks with black entrepreneurs leading the way. And, and you look at Metro City Bank and First Intercontinental Bank, you have some Asian and Indian uh, banks. We need to uh, see that Chinese bank, a new bank in Johns Creek. We need to have uh, black entrepreneurs. Loyal trust. That was Loyal Trust Bank, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I agree with you. I mean, I think economically, anyone that moves up into the middle class is always better because – any, any group of people that do that. I mean, it goes back, I could go back to, you know, we could do the history lesson or go back to the Irish, the German, the Italian, go back to the Asians that came to this country uh, from a variety of countries, whether it was Laos, Japan, South Korea, China, Vietnam, and how a lot of them moved up the ladder. Uh, Latinos that came here, that hard workers, all of them, it seems to be immigrants are always hard workers. There's a reason why they took the danger and the things to be able to come here because they want to succeed. So there's a lot to be said about that, right? Here's, here's a good example about immigrants. The pharmacy in the neighborhood where that Wendy's was, where the shooting and then the ensuing civil unrest happened, the pharmacy in that neighborhood was started by an immigrant gentleman from Swanee who invested his life worth and life savings down there in that neighborhood, which is near where the, the Brave Stadium was, George State has taken right. over. He had some confidence on that neighborhood, but there are a lot of senior citizens there who are homebound. They deliver a lot of those uh, prescriptions to those senior citizens in need. There are schools there. It is tragic to have all hell breaking loose in that neighborhood that was on the upswing and revitalizing, but has a lot of people who've lived there their whole life, and now they're senior citizens. You've got kids in school, George Washington Carver, is the high school there. We need to restore safety to communities ASAP. So, 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 people- then what would, so then what would you do, Matt, as far as, and then let's let's move on to some other issues too, but just to, because it's it's the thing that's out there. What would you do to reform police? Sure. What would be legislation that would be out there? You know, there's the there's several proposals out there as far as stopping chokeholds and, and limiting liability so that people can sue the police and stuff like that. What would you do? What would be the specific reforms that you'd like to see go in? Well, I would get to the basics first. I think that the examining police training and make sure that the new officers who are coming in police academy are getting best management practices of being effective law enforcement and also not having unnecessary escalation. I think that community policing works. So I think having a recruitment effort of uh, letting middle school and high school students in Clayton County and DeKalb County and Fulton County inside the perimeter know that you have a bright future, both on your, your education as well as employment. If you want to devote your career to being in law enforcement in your own community and making things better in your own community, everybody wants free college. You can go to technical school, do criminal justice there, get a, a two-year degree for a, a very low cost, and then go to a uh, four-year college in Georgia for criminal justice, again, at very low cost, and then graduate and be a community police officer in Atlanta and have a bright future. And I think letting kids know that in Georgia we respect law enforcement and that we support law enforcement and, and uh, young people in our diverse uh, young generation have a bright future in law enforcement, and we ought to be on the same side. So I think the police training, recruitment, also, little things like Bruce Lavelle reminded me of the CID, uh, Community Improvement District. They had an idea about a cops cops in the neighborhood program where housing is an issue. You mentioned the, the salary of police officers, uh, as we were talking earlier, is low, and that pushes a lot of police officers to go moonlight and second or third jobs, which stresses them out when they're back on the job as a police officer. Housing, if we can get some affordable housing, for law enforcement officers to live in the communities that they police and be integral parts of the community. Uh, many are already, but housing costs in Atlanta has really sort of disrupted. I, as I'm out in neighborhoods across the 48th Senate District, I see police cars from multiple jurisdictions. And if we could make sure that law enforcement officers are in the community and visible and uh, tied in with their own community where they're policing, I think that'll help a lot. But more than anything else, I think we need to have the message that America is a, a republic and a democracy. Things don't work in America for people to be out of work and out of school. We need to get things uh, back where our kids are learning 
and our businesses are functioning fully because bad things are happening. Uh, some of them we needed to address, but when I, you mentioned uh, your background in New York, I was very disturbed to see what's happening in New York this week in terms of violence, uh, gratuitous violence. That is not helping anything uh, for people to be hitting uh, police officers over the head with bats. And, and, it, and it raises the question, who's giving out those bats? I've seen some pictures of people dropping pallets off of bricks during uh, protests. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know about that part of it. And yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of things on the web and stuff on social media that right. are they real? Are they not? I mean, it's just it's yeah. a variety of things. And I'm not saying, you know, violence, even if if if, if a group is angry because of what's going on, there is no reason in the world. I don't care. There's no reason to throw a Molotov cocktail into an empty police car. There's no reason to be burning a Wendy's down. There's just no reason for any of that violence. It's just, it it doesn't help the cause and it changes. It does change the narrative and to a bad way, right? Because everyone says, oh, that changes the narrative when you discuss that. You know what? It has to be discussed because it's wrong. How do we teach our kids? I teach my kids right and wrong. Now, you know, I don't know about other people, but if it's wrong to throw a Molotov cocktail into a car, it's wrong. You just don't drive by and throw one in there, even if it's empty. I mean, it's just like, you can never understand that. But I, I agree with you. I mean, we have to, it's a cultural thing too. And we have to really observe all of that and, and really come, at least move down the road a little bit, right? Um, That's right. Every, everything you've said, it makes sense to, you know, to that. And we do need to wait change the way some of the police are trained, I guess. Let's move on to some other issues. We are getting towards the end of our time together, so I do want to make sure we hit sure. things. Um, and Rico, let me just say, in addition to Gwinnett Schools, Gwinnett Police, that's who polices uh, Peachtree Corners. Yes. Gwinnett Police, Gwinnett Police. I've done ride-alongs through Leadership Gwinnett and pay attention to what's going on in my local. Who's going to fight for the budget uh, gaps that are needed when we need funding as well as public policy changes for Gwinnett Police and and for our local police departments, I want to be an effective advocate. That's the stakes in the state Senate race. Who can go down there and get things done for our local law enforcement, our local schools, transportation solutions, health care? Washington's not going to solve our health care. We can't just punt and say Medicaid is going to take it over. We need to make sure that we have jobs and insurance and good uh, health care networks here in Georgia. No one's going to do it for us. We've got to go send an advocate from our community down there to uh, get good things done on those basic needs. Okay. Good to hear. The other issues you, you've been talking about, I think on the campaign trail has been nonpartisan county offices, nonpartisan term limits. Do you think state Senate should be term limited? Yes. I think if you can't go get good things done and, in eight years, pass the baton to somebody else who could do it. Now, when you get elected, I think you ought to serve out your term and uh, you know not be looking at some other higher office. You need to be focused on doing a good job in a short amount of time and then go uh, live under the laws that you make. That's the principle of having nonpartisan and term limited elections. Uh, all of the cities in the 48th Senate District have nonpartisan municipal elections, and it works great. Uh, Gwinnett County we now have a multi-billion dollar county budget, a multi-billion dollar yeah. school budget. And of course, in Fulton County, they have an equally uh, large school and county budget. Their population is over a million. We're right at a million in Gwinnett. I think having more people having a seat at the table with this high population and budget is a good thing. I think having citizen legislators and not partisan career politicians, I think that would be a good improvement. Our cities are already doing it. And let's pass it on to our counties. Now, this is not a new issue for me. I've been an advocate for this in the past. I was the Republican Party lawyer as well as the Gwinnett County Bar Association president. And I got called upon from having served in those two roles to advocate for the magistrate court and the probate court in Gwinnett to go nonpartisan six or seven years ago. Representative Chuck F. Stration was a leader in that initiative. Those offices went nonpartisan years ago. I got to go to the bill signing. I've got the the bill signing pen from Governor Deal and, and those nonpartisan offices have worked well since then, as well as our cities being nonpartisan. And listen, I'm a bipartisan problem solver. I'm a fiscal conservative and, and proud to be a Republican, but I want to reach out to 
Democrats and independents and get some good public policy that will serve our community and our state. That's what I'm all about. Cool. The, um, let's get back. Uh, okay. Uh, and by the way, if anyone notices, there's been some interruption of a Facebook live stream. So you'll get this full version after, after the show. So what, are, you know, let's, let's talk a bit about, you know, term limits is one thing. Yes. We want to make sure that we have new, new, fresh people in place instead of someone in their 20 years, let's say, because that's having people in, in a position too long. There's something to be said about experience, but there's also something to be said about the power structure when you have people in place for 20 or 30 years in the same seat, right? It becomes a bit of a contrary to growth, if you will. But ethics, ethics is the other issue that you discuss. Ethics is a very tough issue. It's tough to be self-regulated. It's tough for a body, a state senate or a state house to have their own ethics committee and they're going to self-regulate themselves. That's a bit of an issue. I don't know how well that can be done. And it seems like it almost never can be done well. I've never seen it yet that way. Well, how, how do you think you can do it different? Sure. And I put this in there just to, to let folks know in the Senate district that I think that state government and the state Senate ought to serve the people. And that ought to be the focus and that we ought to have transparency in government. And we need to have you know a vibrant system where everybody knows what's going on at the Capitol. Now, the state ethics commission that's across the street from the Capitol, the, the House and Senate have their own ethics committees. But what I'm talking about is the state ethics commission. I want to make sure they have the resources and the infrastructure to handle their matters uh, promptly. There was just so much, so much turnover over the course of a decade in that office. Uh, we've now got a good former prosecutor in there. We've got some great uh, lawyers and personnel in the office. And I want to make sure that they can process their cases efficiently, just like a good district attorney's office would. You look at Danny Porter and how well he runs things in Gwinnett. And I, I, I don't think that their focus should be prosecuting people, but I think that they they should have a good, efficient system where they process their cases from beginning to end a lot more quickly and efficiently. And there's a procedure to weed out the overtly political matters that get opened up versus ones where there's an actual problem with disclosure and transparency. I've raised uh, my money locally from people uh, primarily in the Senate district or some tied at the Senate district. I look at races around Metro Atlanta and you have this flood of outside money coming in. You don't really know uh, where it's coming from or why it's, you know, being spent here in Georgia. But I want to make sure that the state Senate has its focus on serving the people and their districts. And there's transparency and ethics uh, in government, public service and citizen legislators. That's what we need down there at the Capitol and transparency. And I, I believe strongly in that my dad retired a couple of years ago from being a DA in the Southwestern circuit. I worked at the DA's office in law school. I drove up to Madison County every Friday my last year in law school and did prosecution there. So I'm familiar with that whole process of how, you know, prosecutor's office works. And although they're not, I don't want them to be criminal. I do want them to have the resources, the personnel, the procedures in place to be efficient and effective and make sure that we uh, match up with our population. George is going to be almost a top five state after the census. We've been number one in jobs. We're almost a top five state. We need to overhaul everything in state government to make sure that we're delivering that kind of excellence to our citizens. Excellent. We are at the end of our time together. So okay. um, usually what I do, uh, Matt, and you've, we've done this before, is that I'll have the candidate ask for the vote. So you have about sure. two minutes. Give us right. why Matt Reeves should be the state Senate rep for District 48. Peachtree Corners, you were blessed to have some great elected officials, Mayor Mason, the City Council, First Lady, Mrs. Mayor, Debbie Mason, Mary Kay Murphy, School Board Representative, Ben Koo, formerly Lynette Howard. You've got a great bunch of local elected officials. I want to augment uh, that excellence down at the state capitol and effectively be an advocate for Peachtree Corners down there. Bipartisan problem solving. Uh, you look at the Simpsonwood matter where I represented the church. I worked uh, closely with UPCCA. That's how I met Scott Hilton years ago. I worked with the elected officials of the city and the county, went to probate court, superior court, appellate court, but problem solved along the way in a way that that property is now a park rather than uh, a controversy that worries everybody. 
So that's a good example of what I've done out here in the district the last 17 years as a business and real estate litigation lawyer. And I've also cared about the community. I've been actively involved in things like the Duluth Parks Board, the Gwinnett County Education Splost Renewal Campaign, Rotary and other civic matters. I care about the future of our community just like you do. I want to be an effective advocate for Peachtree Corners, Berkeley Lake, Duluth, and other communities down in the state Senate. I'd be honored to earn your support. Matt Reeves for Senate is my website. Matt Reeves for State Senate on Facebook, at Matt Reeves GA on Twitter. Let me hear from you. 770-236-9768 is my number. Call me anytime. I'd love to uh, get to hear about you and your perspective on how Peachtree Corners can be an excellent community through uh, advocacy in the state Senate over the next uh, two years. Thank you. Excellent, Matt. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Stay with me while we log off. But everyone, thank you for uh, listening in. Matt Reeves, candidate, Republican candidate for State Senate District 48. Uh, that represents part that represents Peachtree Corners among other cities within that state Senate district. So that's coming up November 3rd is the election. There's early voting that's going to be happening, obviously, for that, I believe. Uh, October 12th. Okay. October 12th. That's early uh, voting. Okay. Yep. Well, okay. Right. The election, if you deem to go in, November 3rd is the, is the it's, but yeah, October 12th. So check out, uh, go to, you know, make sure you, you're uh, actually can. People registered to vote yet? Or we yes, that? absolutely. Okay. Gwinnett County Board of Elections, as well as uh, Secretary of State, if you've moved or you're new, get registered uh, now. Make sure there's no surprises as you get close to the election. And be prepared to either absentee vote, early vote, starting uh, October 12th, or uh, vote in person November the 3rd. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening to Peachtree Corners Life with Rigo Figliolini. You can listen to our live stream on Spreaker every Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. or on demand at iHeartRadio, Spotify, and iTunes. Don't forget to like our Facebook page for notification of our live video streams of the show. Catch our other podcast shows at peachtreecornerslife.com.